Hello and happy Friday to everyone. Happy December Friday. We are very excited to bring you another live stream. And today we have a special guest, Jonathan Winbush. And we are here to talk today about understanding cinema 4D in Unreal for motion graphics. Uh, this is our second motion graphics stream, and we're really excited to have Jonathan Winbush here to talk about uh, motion graphics with Cinema 4D. Uh, Jonathan Winbush has, uh, you know, been doing motion <clears throat> graphics professionally for many, many years. Uh, you know, a very uh, uh, award-winning pioneer of uh, VR, but also been working in the motion graphics field for a long time. So it's kind of a treat to have a professional join us. Um, maybe what was it about six weeks ago? We had uh, Patrick Womble join us, uh, and he shared some really awesome motion graphics. And, and knowing that, uh, with the number of educators that teach motion graphics in general, and the number of academic programs that focus on motion graphics, it's great to have uh, Winbush join us here today. You know, from the perspective of a professional currently working, doing a ton of work. Uh, with many clients in Unreal Engine doing motion graphics. Uh, we've been talking for a couple of weeks about the kind of work he's doing and, and how this has really revolutionized his workflow. So it's exciting to have him join us uh, and tell us, a, well, before I ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself, once again, thank you, Tom Shannon, for being with us today and Mark Flanagan for joining us from the, <laughs> a very cold apartment in uh, London. <laughs> Uh, uh, mm. sadly, Mark's heat went out. And so you can see he's bundled up over there. Uh, there may be blankets. There may be blankets and, and warm mead and eggnog and the such. Uh, <laughs> no mead, maybe not. Uh, but Jonathan, welcome. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's great to have you here. Um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and, you know, We've got a lot of material that you're going to jump into today, but we really want to get to know you a little bit before we jump in all that stuff. Yeah. So first off, what up, what up? Thank you guys for having me on the stream today. My name is Jonathan Winbush, also known as Winbush. That just comes from, I guess, like my high school athlete days. You know, they used to just call you by your last name. So just something that always stuck with me. But I've been doing um, motion graphics professionally since around 2006. I got my start by interning under Adam Sandler, where I got to work at Happy Madison and his motion graphics company under Happy Madison, which was called Framework. And from there, I got to work on main title movie sequences, um, TV shows, commercials, movie trailers. I even did some Blu-ray work back on like Blu-rays we're in uh, the HD wars, I guess, for that stuff. So yeah, HD DVD and Blu-ray and Blu-ray went out. So they were still trying to figure it out. But I got to design some Blu-rays with JavaScript and stuff like that. So my body of work back then just goes across the gamut. And so from there, you know, I just freelanced around Hollywood for a bit and then landed at Warner Brothers, where again, I was doing motion graphics. I worked on a lot of stuff for um, Big Bang Theory, Two and a Half Men, some of the theatrical stuff with Batman, a lot of Comic-Con stuff every year. And then that's where I kind of got my first taste of real-time technology because I was doing stuff with WB Games while I was there. And so that's when, like back when I was doing motion graphics at WB Games, I was basically working in like the marketing department. And so what we would do was we would, we would have like developer kits of the Xbox 360 and that would allow us to pretty much go into like God mode into any game. So we would go into, let's say like Lego Batman 2. I would have my son actually come in and play like, you know, the gameplay as the characters and stuff. And he's just running through the levels while I have a second Xbox controller and I'm actually controlling, you know, like camera angles and getting yeah. the different perspectives. Yeah. And at that time, we're just recording everything to a tape deck. So we had the Xbox actually going to like a tape deck and we're just recording the gameplay and it was kind of at that, that was like my first, you know, taste of real time tech, because then we would take the scenes from the gameplay, have to take them into like After Effects or something to actually track the footage because there's no way to, you know, export out the scenes and stuff. And then I would have to try to match that 3D with like Cinema 4D. And that's when it was like, why can I play this game in real time? And it looks phenomenal. And then I have to match this with Cinema and I have to render for like a day and a half or something crazy. Like it just, you know, I know we talked about it in the past, but that was kind of my first realization with it. But um, yeah, that's pretty much my background history there. 
Well, let's do one thing really quickly. I mean, we, we get all kinds of people that attend our streams. Uh, you know, it's possible that some people don't even really understand, know, you know, or maybe understand what motion graphics is as a, as a full area of, of, of work or discipline, right? So, you know, right. you know, let's define motion graphics so that we all start at the right baseline. You know, what is motion graphics, you know, compared to 3D animation or, or you know, character right. or whatever? What, what's motion graphics in general? Yeah, I feel like motion graphics is a genre that's kind of hard to define, especially because it's evolving so much over the years. Like when I first started, motion graphics was pretty much defined as, you know, like at the top of a TV show or a movie, you would have like your title sequences and infographics, things of that nature that didn't really incorporate too much, you know, live footage or anything of that nature. That's what motion graphics was back then. But I feel like it's kind of tra transcended into like a whole gamut of everything. So like now, like my official title is a motion graphics artist, but I do a lot of work for Discovery Channel where I'm doing like full CG environments like in 3D and, you know, like uh, it's almost like Pixar, but not Pixar level. So it's like I'm doing a full 3D scenes and everything there on top of doing the title sequences, the lower thirds, um, mm -hmm. the Skypes, the mortises. And so motion graphics, I guess these days would be anything that, you know, has any type of graphics that's not, you know, fully live video. Like there's always some type of graphical element to it. Right. So even like at the beginning of the movies, like, you know, uh, I was watching uh, a trailer for the new James Bond movie and, and uh, even all that stuff they do at the beginning of the movie that is not really quite the movie or even, uh, I know yeah. this dates me a little bit, but the beginning of Fight Club, right? Like where they're, they're doing some <laughs> of that cool stuff that may be done by a motion graphics company, right? Uh, so it's not yeah, particularly, uh, you know, a CG company, but it's a company that specializes in motion graphics. And some of it's done purely in 2D. And in, in, in the past, some of that yeah. stuff was done entirely in, in 2D and maybe done in After Effects, may have been done in some compositing package. But more right. and more, I think motion graphics has started to really creep into 3D, I think. And that's one of the things that's been interesting is that you've started to really specialize in some of the 3D aspects and, and where I think Unreal Engine creeps into it or, you know, not creeps into it, where it burst the door down is that uh, <laughs> Unreal Engine sort yeah. of said, well, um, and what you were kind of describing is that there have been huge um, sports companies that were spending a fortune on these machines that would render these 2D graphics in real time but they cost a lot of money, right? And so uh, right. motion graphics artists like yourself are saying, well, why am I spending all this time in front of these very expensive machines that are kind of not real time and, and very slow and render fairly primitive graphics when I can do 3D and mimic 2D in front of Unreal Engine and work with the same kind of clients and deliver unbelievable quality and results. And so, uh, right. it, you know, can you share some of your experience and, you know, and how that transcended uh, the work that you were doing in the past? Cause we were talking about this a little bit earlier and I was fascinated by what you were telling us about that. Yeah. So, I mean, this dates back again to my days at Warner brothers. Like we had artists based that were strictly for like those old school Autodesk machines. Well, I guess they're still around, but yeah, like the Flint, the flame, the smoke machines, things of that nature, which I guess that would be, um, like your compositing suites, like they do 2D, you could do like live green screen king and things of that nature, a little bit of 3D, more like two and a half D. But like back then, I forget what year this was, but you know, like um, After Effects artists and Cinema 4D artists were really on the rise. I got brought into Warner Brothers and I kind of got the push from like the flame artists because they would always come over and say like, hey, check what I'm doing in a flame. And I'm like, oh, I could bang that out in After Effects here. Come look at my desk and you can see the discrepancy in there because those machines cost like a hundred thousand dollars and here i am on some software that's just like a couple thousand and i'm able to get you know the same results if not better but that was kind of like that kind of showed me that you have to try to keep up with the times because you know this technology is continuing to grow especially in our field because our clients want us to be able to work faster and still keep the same type of quality mm -hmm. so that kind of brings me to like fast forward to 2020 this summer, I worked on a program for Discovery Channel called Alaskan Bush People, which I had to deliver at 4K 60 frames per second. 
And normally, like my render of choice out of cinema would be Redshift or Octane. Those are GPU renders, which they're fast, especially if you have like multi GPUs, you could get that much faster out of your system. But you know, 4K 60 FPS, that would still take an eternity, even if you had like a render farm. But I kind of just threw myself in the fire. I was like, you know what? I've been working with Unreal. I'm really comfortable. Yeah, I could do 4K 60 FPS. And you they told were just the client like, really? This? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, not a problem at all. So <laughs> I banged out the graphics, the first graphics there. I showed them and they're like, you did that in like a couple of days. And it usually takes you like a week, week and a half. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's just my new workflow and the pipeline that I've been developing over the past year. I'm really getting comfortable with this software. And they're like, well, would it be too much to ask if we can, you know, like, cause I had to build like a forest scene and I have like a house building up on top of a mountain. And then they're like, well, in the real world, there's no trees over there. And there's kind of like a rock wall over here. And would it be too much to make these little changes? We know it might take a day or two. And later that day I sent over another render and they're just like, what the heck? <laughs> it's like, I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have shown my cards cause now they probably expect it all the time, but it's just, you know, I get so excited with new technologies and just being able to showcase that type of stuff. And that just kind of gave them the confidence in like, hey, we're getting the same type of quality we've always gotten from you. But, you know, we can make changes and, you know, push the boundaries a little bit further, which is always great. You know, it's like you always want to be able to spend more time on being creative and less time on rendering. So it gives you that flexibility to really push your, you know, your scenes to that next level. So I know well, what- and as a I'm As sorry. a contractor, uh, you know, working with clients, the last thing you ever want to do is say no. Right. Uh, right. And so the ability to more often say yes when they're like, can we put a rock wall here? Yeah. And and to reduce that friction because I know yeah. I've had, had to have a lot of kind of complicated conversations to explain why rendering takes so long and if they want an animation yeah. and you know, there's a lot yeah. of, you know, charts and breakdowns of time. <laughs> there's a lot of education. <laughs> Man hours. Whereas right? in this case, you can just say, okay, you know, it's really down to the production but time and the rendering. What's it's the difference? A, you know, so, you know, for the those that don't know the workflow of motion graphics. So if it took you a week, the last pipeline, what in this pipeline yeah. is different? Uh, you know, and we'll get into it when you actually get into, you know, sharing your screen and showing people. But you know, if you had to yeah. describe in a couple sentences, what is the difference in the pipeline that makes Unreal Engine uh, motion motion graphics different? Yeah, so the biggest thing that came to mind, like I told you guys, I, I built like large environments, especially for Discovery Channel shows. And so a lot of times, like I always try to use assets that are optimized for the scene, no matter what, just because, you know, that's just proper practice. But a lot of times, like if I'm trying to build a huge forest and I'm trying to render out, like say maybe in Redshift, those frames might take like five to 10 minutes to render per frame. And so sometimes I would have to make compromises and say like, okay, let me go through my camera move and really see what's showing in the camera because I would have to, you know, like start deleting polygons and I'd actually do it to like my actual landscape, like the ground landscape, like, okay, we don't see this section when the camera move is, you know, going through its sequence. And so I'm going to delete these polygons. And I would spend a long time, you know, like going through and making those compromises just so that I could get my render times down. Cause you know, a lot of these sequences are long and, you know, it's like a lot of times I would have to render overnight and to do that mm. and get it, you know, to decline on time, I'd have to break my scene down to at least like a minute or two minutes per frame. And so I've noticed when I was building my scenes out in Unreal, especially with the foliage brush, I mean, that thing was amazing. Like I brought in my landscape in there, I'm painting my tree lines in the scene and I'm flying through like these huge environments. And that just was really what broke it down for me. So being able to work in like really large landscapes and not have any type of breakdown, especially in the viewport and still get good render times. I mean, that was a huge accomplishment and really opened up my eyes there. Mm. I mean, we boast about, you know, 30, 60 frames a second, but for a motion graphics artist that's delivering frames or, or video, yeah, being able to render at, you know, being able to work at 30 or 60 frames a second is just amazing. But being able yeah. to dump out yeah. frames as fast as your 
your hard drive can render them has got to be a an, an enormous game changer, you know, especially if you just have to buy a graphics card that can handle whatever workflow you can throw at it, right? Yeah, 100%. Like I would know for us as motion graphics artists, if the client was like, hey, this project is 24 frames per second, everybody would rejoice because that's six less frames you would have to render. Like usually it's 30 frames mm -hmm. for, um, you know, we do 30 FPS, but they're like, oh no, this one, we could do 24. We want it to look more cinematic. And it's like, right. okay, that's six less frames that we have to render per um per second there so well i mean you know, those frames when they they count you know because yeah. that just adds to your render time there's kind of a bunch of questions <laughs> that people are already uh you know bringing in here and some of them are like people that are interested in getting involved in motion graphics and there's a lot of work in this field right i mean there's 100%. there's a demand tremendous demand and i know that um i taught at a university that had a formal program in motion graphics with hundreds of students in it and they all got yeah. a lot of work. There was a huge demand for these students. Uh, Savannah College of Art and Design has a, a, a great uh, motion graphics program. Um, you know, um, how do you get involved or what do you do? Or, you know, what's the deal with, uh, you know, becoming a motion graphics artist in general? Uh, do you have to go to school? Did you go to school? Yeah, so I'm going to show my age here. So, <laughs> yeah, I did go to school. I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh where I got my bachelor's for motion graphics and VFX. And to put it in context, I was in the very first class of that. Like, motion graphics was brand new to any curriculum. Like, I think they might have been the first to have it. So, I was in that first class of graduates that actually graduated with, you know, a, an official bachelor's degree in motion graphics. Hmm. And then back then, there wasn't really like an online presence, you know, like the internet's there, but not like how it is today. So I had to mail my, you know, my rear out on physical DVDs. Like I had a DVD burner. I would get a 50 pack burn off 50 with my rear and just <laughs> hand mail them, you know, to all the different studios. Um, I really wanted to work in California. So I mostly mailed them out to there and that's kind of how I got my start. But, um, I would say nowadays, because my son, he's 18 and he's interested in motion graphics. And I just kind of been looking at the landscape from his perspective. And it seems like, I don't want to say it's easier, but the barrier to entry is a lot less because sure. you have, you know, all these great portfolio sites like Behance or ArtStation, you have Instagram, YouTube. I mean, you could get your work out there and then you just kind of throw yourself into the community. Like I've seen people this year alone really start building up their name amongst the peers because they're showing, you know, the work and they're commenting on other work and they're getting involved in the live streams. And before you know it, people start to take notice. And then that's a great way to get into it because, you know, these artists are working at different studios, say like, you know, Universal Studios, they'll say like, hey, John, you know, we need another freelance motion graphics artist for this project. Do you know anybody? Yeah. And I could say like, hey, you know what? I've been talking to this guy, Logan, here's his portfolio. He seems like a really solid guy. Maybe give him a shot and you just kind of work your way in there. So I would say networking is probably the number one, you know, key to getting into the industry, but um, yeah, just putting yourself out there and really just showing what you have. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. There's a couple questions coming in actually about, uh, you know, is, is 30 frames still the, the key frame rate or are you working at 120 yet because clients are saying i need super buttery frames or you know uh, now that you can yeah, work at yeah. much higher frame rates is that become something right. that's being requested so for me personally 60 was the highest that was requested and that just came over this past summer but normally typically it's a usually around 30 frames per second or in broadcast 29.97 yeah. Sometimes if I'm doing theatrical work, like I still do a lot of movie trailer work, that stuff is all 24 frames per second. But um, yeah, I haven't had a request for 120 yet, which, <laughs> yeah, that would be crazy. But yeah, I would say the highest is 60 right now. And so typically if you're working a TV, 30 is still right. what you're probably going to be for aiming drop at. frame 29.97. Um, some people yeah. are asking about uh, hardware specs, you know, when you're, when you're working in specifically in Unreal Engine and um, doing motion graphics, do you need super beefy machines or, you know, what kind of hardware specs are you running? Yeah, so you can get away with the mid-level machine, I think would be um, suffice. But like, you know, I've been doing this for a lot of years, so I've really invested in myself, especially since I, you know, I have my own studio, I work from home. 
and everything relies on me. So I got the best of the best. Well, at the time, this was last year, but I'm working with the 2080 Ti, and then my CPU is the AMD Threadripper, the 3990X, mm -hmm. which is like the 64 core one. And then I have uh, 128 gigs of RAM. So I just went, about you know, full board all out to, you know, well, this is pre, I bought this pre um, Unreal as well. So I was still doing a lot of GPU rendering. Like I used yeah. to have in this machine, three 2080 Ti's. But once I got more comfortable into Unreal, I actually sold two of them on eBay. Like I just started eBaying all my stuff this year. That became like my my side hobby <laughs> is eBaying all my render farm stuff out because it's like I no longer really need it. So <laughs> right, wow. right. Well, you know, let's yeah. get into that for a little bit because I thought I found this really interesting. How did you uh, stumble into Unrealville in, in general? Because it, uh, this is a really interesting story too. Yeah, so it surprises a lot of people. Like it was actually just. 2019 at SIGGRAPH, I was there at um, just visiting, you know, I wasn't, I don't think I was presenting at that SIGGRAPH, but I was just there because it was up in LA, it was local. So I went to the convention center. I was at the Maxon booth, just talking to people. And I think the Epic booth was like right across from it. And at that point, you guys had made your announcement about, you know, like the new stuff that was coming into that current update. And one of those announcements was, with the Datasmith plugin, you are having Cinema 4D integration. So that meant that you could take your scene from Cinema 4D and bring it over to Unreal Engine, which really excited me because I watched the talk with um, Capacity because I know they've been using Unreal for their motion graphics. And this was like pre, you know, Datasmith plugin. So once I saw that, you know, their presentation, what they were doing with Rocket League and stuff, it got me excited. I'm like, I know Cinema like the back of my hand. I'm going to go home see how well this integrates because i really have a fascination with video games and you know unreal I, every time i play a game you see the unreal logo so it just kind of brought like my two worlds together and you know there wasn't a ton of documentation there and there was zero videos on it so i took it upon myself to just stay up the whole night just you hmm. know experimenting seeing how the two would work together and with me, it's like I'm a visual learner and I just I have like a whole archive of just me doing like work on my desktop. Like I usually just have OBS up and when I'm trying to figure stuff out, I'm just recording my screen capture. And that way, you know, if I need to figure it out three months down the line, I could just go like, oh, yeah, I did that three months ago. Here's how I did it. And I don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so Smart. I did that. And then I kind of put it into like presentation form to throw up on my YouTube channel. And then I went to SIGGRAPH the very next day and I met with Paul Blab um, of Maxon and he's just like, dude, I saw your video up on YouTube. How in the heck did you figure that out so quick? We just, you know, heard about this integration because I guess you guys had did it on your end. And I was just like, yeah, I just get excited with new technology. And I looked at the YouTube and it already had like a couple of thousand views and a lot of people really interested in it. And so that kind of just kicked it off for me because people ask questions like, hey, I'm following your tutorial, but I'm having trouble doing X, Y, and Z. So I'm like, okay, let me figure that out. And then I'm just throwing stuff on YouTube as I'm figuring it out. And it just kind of put me down that rabbit hole there. And next thing you know, everybody started calling me like the C4D Unreal guy. And I just, <laughs> you know, that became my title this past year. But it just came out of, you know, my passion for just always trying to evolve and learn. So yeah. it just really excited me there. And I just hit, you know, dove head first right into it. But then you started working with uh, 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 Andy Blondin and Patrick Wombo, who are both product specialists yeah. on the uh, uh, motion graphic side of Unreal. And, you know, they do multiple things. Uh, they are designers and specialists and technical account managers on the Epic side, focusing on motion graphics amongst other things, um, you know, media frameworks. And, and so you could build connections and relationships with those guys. And they started really enjoying right. your training and, and learning material and uh, help connect us with you as well. And so uh, um, right. I think that makes a big difference too, when they look at workflows, but specifically the workflows that you're sharing with the community. And they're like, Hey, this guy actually uh, is doing good stuff and helping the community, uh, which internal validation from Epic is always good. You know, like, uh, you know, yeah, and no, I appreciate that. If if you guys uh, in the community out there are doing things like that and posting it out there and, and you're working with our product specialists and they reach out and say, hey, uh, you know, these guys are doing good stuff. That's that's fantastic. And we it helps 
everyone internal to Epic because we are still a relatively small team of people, you know, trying to get the word out. And and you look at what's happening here with uh, motion graphics and the potential revolutions of being able to get client work at the kind of speed that you're doing. And, and the, I think these messages need to get out to a lot more motion graphics artists. And, and I think it's really fortunate and thankful that you're spreading the word <clears> as opposed to just saying, Hey, I, I've got these secrets that I'm just going to keep to myself because <laughs> there's more work for me. Right. right. You know, like, uh, um, yeah, I, I never believed in that because just like, I always go back to my time as an intern, like when I worked for happy Madison, I was blessed enough to have a paid internship and they told me right off the bat, we're not paying you to um, go get coffee or do, you know, like the different runs or everything that you hear, like horror stories from interns. They're like, we brought you on board to mold you as an artist that we can eventually hire out. And so my first couple of months there, I was able to just walk around the stable, talk to all the different artists. They're sharing their workflows with me and you know, I'm getting all these free knowledge from veterans there. So it's like, I never liked the type of artist that's like, I figured these secrets out. I'm going to hoard them for myself just because that brings more work for me. I always felt like, I believe in karma. If you, yeah. you know, if you reciprocate that stuff out, it comes right back to you. So anything that, you know, all the knowledge that I've obtained, I've always gone out of my way to help other people. That's amazing. They ask, so. That's amazing. Yeah, I feel 100% behind that, like never hoard the knowledge because we're all into it, to, you know, all in it together. The artist community is very, for sure. very small. For sure. You know, there's a um, question that's popping in already about, you know, what other rendering features are coming in. Like 426 uh, is filled with stuff that has benefited the motion graphics community. And, and I think here in a 100. few minutes, you're going to jump in and share a bunch of that stuff. Uh, at the beginning of... Right. of this uh, stream, we shared some of the render queue, which is just chock full of goodness for motion graphics in general. And for anyone working in virtual production and film in general, uh, who has to right. output to uh, to stuff. And I think you're going to talk about a lot of that stuff in general. Um, Tom, Mark, is there anything that you, you want to bring up before we hand the stream over to Winbush to, to show stuff? of much uh, mutedness um, <clears throat> no just wondering in actual fact if this is changing the, the way in which uh, work is being done sort of for live tv production is there a, a move towards the adoption of unreal in studios to actually really do those last minute um, graphics which tend to be necessary in that yet like, I know places like the NFL Network, they already had it in their workflow. They were doing other live presentations through that. And then I saw for this past U.S. election, they actually used Unreal on, I want to say, the Fox Network, mm -hmm. that all those yeah. graphics were done inside of real time. Um, for your traditional boutique shops, like, it's still kind of hard to tell because we're in the middle of a pandemic. So everybody's still working remotely. And so I don't think a lot of the boutiques have had the opportunity to really explore it because everybody's working remote. So this is not the time. I guess a lot of them really want to rock the boat yet. Like I, I've had places reach out to me interested just in the workflows. And that's why I kind of made my course at the beginning of the year. I did make a beginner's course for motion graphics artists wanting to jump into Unreal. And I built that just to kind of help people that had an interest in motion graphics and Unreal, just kind of giving them, you know, like all this stuff that I went through and here's how I got to X, Y, and Z. And I think once stuff goes back to normal and everybody's starting to work back in the office, I think we're going to see a lot more adoption in this stuff. Yeah, I've got the course up right now. Uh, it's on monogram.com. Uh, uh, Mograph.com. I'm sorry, Mograph. Uh, and... Um... Yeah, you can see it here. And actually, at the end of today's stream, we're going to put out a survey. And uh, everyone who fills out the survey, I think uh, we're going to give away a, uh invitation to one of these. Is that right, uh, Winbush? Yeah, yeah. We'll give away one course to one of the lucky winners there. Awesome. And you also, a couple other links that I brought up here are, of course, your... Um, your website as well as your art station and your YouTube channel. So uh, um, you've got a ton of videos on your YouTube channel here and everyone should completely be aware that you've got a lot of great free stuff here. 
everyone should check yeah, it out. Yeah, I think I just crossed the 200 mark, I think, the other day. A couple of tutorials back. So, yeah, I have at least 200 tutorials up there. Wow. <laughs> that is a fair so, amount of stuff. And, you know, I wanted to bring up the that your kind of journey into Unreal and in becoming the Unreal C4D guy mirrors a lot of people. Um, and, and we tell this to students and educators quite a bit, that it's kind of a world of opportunity right now because it's all new. So right. there is no expert in this new stuff that's coming out. So it's a great yeah, opportunity absolutely. to become that expert and really you just have to kind of dig in but that's not it. You also have to let everyone know that you're doing that. And I did it myself. It's kind of how I, you know, became the unreal biz guy and I wrote a book about it, et cetera. And it was just because nice. everything, and it was kind of a similar thing. I was putting a lot of it up there so that I would yeah. document it myself to understand it and to help give me process. And um, even now I still will sometimes search for something in unreal and stumble across my old post. And I'm like, ah, Look, I knew how to do that three years ago. It's a good <laughs> thing I wrote it down and put it on the forum. So um, it's it's um, you know it really speaks to that there's a lot of opportunity for students and people switching careers, self learners to to enter into this industry and to do new things. It's a lot of new stuff. And, right, but but and put yourself one, out there. The one thing I do like to emphasize too, because I know there is. Like, you know, with anything new, there's always going to be pushback to it. And so I always tell people, like, don't look at look at Unreal as something that could be complementary to your workflow. You know, use it where it makes sense, but don't force it. Like, I know a lot of people are like, this doesn't work for this situation. It's like, well, then don't use it for that situation. Like, use Unreal as something that will complement you in your workflow and only make you a better artist. And so... That's the one thing I like to put out there. Add it to your pipeline. It doesn't have to replace anything. You just mm -hmm. add it. And that's just another skill set. That's a you know, great like, point. That's a great yeah, point. Yeah, I know. Like, I had an opportunity to do a virtual production set over the summer just because I had Unreal under my moniker. Like, somebody hit me up on Instagram and said, like, hey, um, I don't think I can name the artist, but they were doing a music video for an artist. And they saw my Unreal stuff on Instagram. And... They didn't even talk to me about like my motion graphics, you know, background. They were just like, we know you're an unreal artist. Can you build this environment that we could throw up on the LED screens? And it's just like me having unreal in my arsenal allowed me to be able to take that job. You know, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to take. Yeah. You know, before we hand the stream over, I want to um, address a, a comment in the stream. Uh, these are not real beards. This, these are features of 4.26. <laughs> Um, this is the new hair grooming uh, system yeah. in Unreal Engine 4.26. So mm -hmm. uh, this is Niagara just, driven. This it's is amazing. just what uh, Unreal has evolved to. Um, so and yeah, and I'm actually a meerkat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen the meerkat scene, go and download that as well. Oh, absolutely. Hey. I haven't learned a new system yet. That's why my my hair follicles. <laughs> been, he's been <laughs> focusing on motion <laughs> graphics. The and, uh, so yes. the, you can yeah. only learn so much, you know. That's right. <laughs> right. You can only be a master. <laughs> um, right. All right. Um, why don't we? Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to take time away from all the great stuff that I know you're going to share with us, uh, which you know we are capable because we love to talk on the stream. Uh, so we're going to hand the stream over to you and let you share all the amazing stuff that you have to share with this community. And we are going to fade into the background and do this with our delightful fake beards. So whenever you're okay. ready. Okay. We I are will ready. Share. It doesn't look like I shared a, oh yeah, here we go. So it's desktop. Let me close this down. Are you guys seeing my desktop here? We are seeing you. I'm gonna pin your video so you are featured. Perfect. So whenever you guys are ready to rock, let me know. When we are there. Yeah, it's all this. you. All right. Perfect. So this is the latest version of Cinema 4D. This is version R23. And I already have a scene that is pre-built here. So let me play through this real quick. So it's just a simple camera move and the Unreal Engine logo, you know, consolidating together there at the end. And it's pretty basic. Like I took a vector file of the Unreal logo, just extruded it out in 3D and cinema, which is extremely easy to do. 
And then just do like a random effector on there, just so I have the letters kind of fall into place there. So it's really, really simple there. And for the camera move, it's also a simple camera move. Like I have the way that I like navigate my cameras is I always like having a point of like a, have a point of entry or not entry, a point of interest. And so I usually bring in like a null point here because that's invisible whenever you're rendering. And I'll take my camera and I'll add this little target tag to it. So if you go over to like your camera or any object in general, if you come down to tags, animation tags, you'll come up with this tag called target. And what you can do is, let me pull this up so we can see it a little bit better. Right here under tag properties, we, it says tag ob or target object. I'm just gonna click and drag the null into there, which is already there. And that means no matter where the camera is in your scene, it's always gonna look at that null point. And that helps me not get like any type of wonky camera moves or anything. Like if I click on my camera here and I come down to my coordinate system, this is where we lay our keyframes at. So if I go to the very start, anything that's in red, that means that's where we have a keyframe laid in. And you can see like for the scale and the rotation, I don't have any keyframes at all. But as I scroll through my timeline here, we get to the end you can see i have a keyframe here at the end but no keyframes here for the rotation and that's where targeting null comes in because as i scroll through this you can see we're actually getting attributes moving in the rotation and that's because our camera is still rotating a little bit but that's only because it's always pointing at the null so if i go on my quads here you can kind of see how my camera is moving if we look in the overhead position you can see how it rotates and pulls back that's just the tip I like to share because that's how I like to do my camera moves there. But okay, so the next thing from here is like we, we have the scene already set and go. And the next thing we want to do is bring it into Unreal. But there are some things that you need to know ahead of time. Like for the material system, I know a lot of people hit me up like they work in Octane or Redshift or V-Ray, Arnold, you know, things of that nature. For right now, the system only works with the default Cinema 4D materials in which if you just come down here in your material tab, you just double click and you have a material there, which I'm going to delete that because I already have some materials already connected to my scene here. But there's another caveat too, like everything as of right now doesn't transfer over. I believe it's in the official documentation, but I know a couple of things that would transfer over are the color, the um, reflections, if you have a bump map or a normal map, and then also the glow as well. So those are the few things that will transport over. But the way that I've like just working on my workflow over the past year and Unreal to Cin or Cinema to Unreal, I kind of like to do just like solid colors inside of Cinema that will represent what I want to bring over to Unreal. So like if I'm doing like a big landscape and I know like this is going to be a grass field, then I'll just use like a solid green color material inside of Cinema. So when I bring it over to Unreal, it's going to show that green material and I can just easily replace that with like some type of mega scan material for that grass patch there. So that's just something I like to do. I guess the official term is gray boxing for, you know, like game artists and stuff like that. But that's the way I've been working recently. But the cool thing about this is I could come in, click on my gradient here. And let's say I'm just going to pick some random colors so we can see what kind of translates over to Unreal. So for the U, I'm just going to make red for the circle. I'm just picking random colors here just so we have some point of reference when we bring it into Unreal. And then the text, maybe let me make this like a green or something like that. And then I'm going to select all of these here because I'm going to come down to the reflectance channel in which Cinema kind of, the reflections, the way the materials work is like really different from any other 3D application there. So like the way that I've just experimenting on my own, the one thing that I've noticed is the default specular, it comes over to Unreal, but it doesn't always look the greatest. And so to get the best result, I'll just, you know, I'll remove this right here. And then if you click on this add button, it gives you like a whole plethora of different type of reflections that we could pull in here. And the one that seems to work best is this one called GGX. So if I click on this, you can see it makes it like solid silver. And so what you want to do from here under your layers panel, I usually bring this down to like 1%. And that way it gives us a little bit of gloss, maybe 3%. It still gives us a little bit of gloss, but it's not overwhelming. And you can always adjust these once you bring it into Unreal too. Like if you want to use your materials from Cinema and Unreal, you do have the flexibility. It will make a master material in there. And I can show you some of those attributes as well. Let me take a drink. And if there's any questions, let me know.
Cool. So I'm going to make sure I have everything, you know, set up inside of Cinema before I bring it over to Unreal. So the one thing I'd like to do is hit Control D. This is a shortcut on the keyboard, and that brings up the project manager here. And so as we were alluding to earlier, like I really like working in 60 frames per second. By default, this will usually be 30, but I like to bring this up to 60 frames per second. And then there's one other place you have to make sure that you set your frame rate. And if I come under output here and look at the frame rate, make sure this you know coordinates with your um, project setting there. So I have this set at 60 FPS. I'm actually going to delete this here render. I don't know why that's in there. But another thing too is like for your render, you want to make sure that it's on standard, like physical or anything else. That's not going to work when you transfer over. It only understands the standard render. So make sure you have this on standard. Make sure you have your, um, I'm working in HD here. So just make sure you have your ratio set correctly there. And then here under project settings, there's going to be a tab called Cineware. So if I click on that, you want to make sure that you have all these checked marked right here. So where it says Cineware, you want to save your polygon cache. And this is for any animation and then save animation cache as well. And then I always like to click on save material cache. Like I don't have any type of, you know, like JPEGs or PNGs or anything attached. But if you did, you want to make sure that you click on this because it will actually make a texture folder for you. And then it will automatically bring those textures into Unreal Engine. And then down here for format, I usually like working in PNG at like 16 bit. But again, I don't have any type of materials on here. These are just all solid colors for this example. And so it looks like everything is good and ready to go. And so the next step from here is I want to come over to file. And then I want to save the project for Cineware. And this is really important because as of right now, this is the only way that we could transport a scene from Cinema 4D into Unreal Engine. So you want to make sure you come down to save project for Cineware, or if you use in version R21, I believe it's called save project from a launch. This is an update that they um, changed in the most recent versions here, but it's in the same exact spot. So I'm going to click on this. And this brings me into a folder that I had made earlier. I just have a Cinema 4D folder. And the one thing about when you save a project from a launch, it's still going to save it as a .c4d file. And so I kind of just like to organize it so that I know what files are my cinema files and what files are going into Unreal Engine. So this is like my original save file here. I'll click on this. And then I'll come down here where it says file name. And I'm just going to do underscore UE. And the reason that I put UE, this is just something that I came up with. It's like UE that represents Unreal. So whenever I'm in Unreal and I want to import the scene in there, I don't get confused on which files are saved out for Cineware and what files aren't. So that's just a tip that I'd like to share with everybody. So I'm going to click on Save here. And while that's saving out, I'm actually going to open up my Epic Games Launcher. And we're going to do this one in the most recent version, 4.26. So I'm going to launch this one here. And give this a second to load up here. And the cool thing about, I think it started in version 4.25, but they actually give us a bunch of templates now in which you can see right here, if you go to new project categories, we have templates for gaming, for film, television, live events. We have it for ArchViz and then product design too. So when I first started off in Unreal, it was only strictly gaming. And then I think in 4.25, they added this one, which is really cool because it shows the scope that Epic is really trying to reach out into, you know, the other networks for like broadcast and film. So I'm going to click on this one right here as my default. Then I'm going to click on next. And then we have some more templates in here, but usually I just start with a blank slate here. So I'm going to click next again. And then this just gives us a couple of options. Like if we want to have starter content, which will give you like some models to work with or materials, things of that nature. I'm going to do no starter content. Then ray tracing, I can enable it because I do have a RTX card. And then down here where it says my project, I'm just going to name this one Wimbush underscore tutorial. And the reason I did underscore, like watch, if I click the space bar, you see that it pops up red. It says project names can't contain spaces. And so I usually use an underscore. For some reason, Unreal doesn't like spaces. And so that's just good practice. I know editors do that a lot too. So I think I have everything where I want it to be. I'm going to click Create Project, and I'm just going to wait for this to load up here. Then I'm going to check the chat, see if anybody 
has any questions there. I think we're good so far. Okay. Yeah, because this is taking a second to load up, so I'm just going to check. All right, cool. So now we're inside of Unreal Engine. We have a bank or a blank template here. I'm actually going to click on this player start. I'm going to delete that because I don't need it. And then you see up here, usually you would have to um, have an icon here called Datasmith plugin. And that's how you bring your stuff from Cinema into Unreal Engine. If you don't have the icon here, you just have to go and activate it, which if it's your first time, you're probably going to have to opening up a project. So if I come over to settings, come down to plugins, then if I click on built in here, if I go to my search bar right here and type in C4D, you'll see that we have the plugin for the Datasmith C4D importer. We're just going to click on enable and then it's going to pop up with this disclaimer, which everything's fine. It's just letting you know that this is still in beta. So I'm going to click on yes. And then down here, it's going to say restart now, which anytime you activate a plugin and Unreal, as you know, you always have to restart it. And so I'm going to click on restart and then I'm just going to save it and just give us a few more seconds to boot up. Usually doesn't take too long after you restart here. I can actually close that out as well. All right, cool. So we have Unreal opened back up. And now you see we have a button up here at the top. This is Datasmith. So if we click on Datasmith, and then I just have to go to my desktop and find where I saved my project at. So under C4D, and remember, let me pull this out so we can see the conventions. So under type here, you see that it made a C4D file for our Cineware project. And so this is why I always name the Cineware project underscore UE. I just like to drive this home because this shows you that this project is for Unreal, not this one here. Like this is just my Cinema 4D project. So I'm going to click on this one here and click on open. And then I'm just going to save it into my contents folder. Click OK. And then we have this Datasmith import options here. So this basically, if it's your first time bringing everything in, it's safe to just leave all this stuff in. You know, you might want to do stuff like if you have your scene all built out and you might want to add like a camera move or some materials, you could do only that if you want. But I'm just going to bring everything in, just going to leave everything checkmarked on and click import. And now you can see we have our Cinema 4D project inside of Unreal Engine. And it does come with some caveats here. Like I'm going to turn off my sky sphere so we can see a little bit better so if i navigate over to my scene you can see that it doesn't 100 percent bring in all the materials and that's because it depends on how you have it built inside of um cinema 4d like i noticed some stuff that you have in the mograph cloner it's not always going to bring it over fine but it always does bring it over here in your materials panel so if i scroll around here you can see i added it just on the sides but not the faces but it's a real easy fix like if i click on this and then if I come over here to my details panel, you can see that we have some slots down here and these slots basically represent each one of these faces. So let me go and look for where I have my red material, which is actually I should show you guys where it's at. So if I'm here in my content browser and I'm at the very top of my hierarchy, you can see that Cinema 40 actually named or brought in a folder and this name with our project file is. So Unreal logo underscore UE. So if I double click on this, this is going to give us some folders depending on what we built in cinema. So it gives us an animation folder, which it has our sequencer already built in there, which is really cool because it has all of our keyframes and everything brought over. It brings in our geometry, which if you wanted to go through and say, like if you wanted to do anything manipulative to just the G over here, you have the, you know, the capabilities of doing it. So that's really cool. It brings in all your separate geometry. And then it brings in all of our materials here as well, which brings me to the next point, because from here, there's two ways that you could go about this. Like if I know I want this face to be red, I could just click and drag my material onto here and it's already red. Or if I look at my details panel, I could just start clicking and dragging them in here, which gives us a lot of flexibility as well, because like say that I want to have maybe like my bevel hair be a different color, like the green or something. So I could just click on that, just drag it over the bevel. And now, you know, I was able to make those type of choices while in Unreal. I didn't have to go back to cinema and re-export stuff out. So I really like that flexibility that it gives us there as well. So I'm just going to go through and I'm just going to materialize these real quick. I'm going to click and drag these all over. So now I have my yellow ring. 
And what's cool too is if I double click on a material, it brings up the material instance. And so if there is stuff that I want to add to it later, like say I did want to add a normal map, I can actually click this on, activate it, and then down here under normal, I could just turn this on. You can see I already added some normal bump to it. And if I turn this on, I can actually drag in my own normal map. So whatever you're doing inside of Cinema 4D, that's not like the end all be all. You can always manipulate everything inside of Unreal Engine as well. So I'm just going quick, to click. This came in, this material and this material instance was created by the importer, correct? Yes, yeah, 100%. This is, this is Data yep. Smith. So you don't have to make your own uh, base material and figure all of that out. So, which is huge because that's a, yep. you know, learning the material system and building a quality PBR material um, takes a little bit of knowledge. So that's a, yeah, that's a I huge mean, step up. Wow. Look at that thing. Say, you don't have to make it. Yeah. Not to scare anybody, but <laughs> this is what cinema brought over to Unreal Engine. And I mean, you can make it a lot simpler. Of course, it doesn't have to get this crazy, mm -hmm. but this is the reason it's built like this is because it gave you all that flexibility inside of your material node here. So all those nodes and parameters are all these right here. So that's what's cool about the Datasmith plugin is it takes all the guesswork out of it, especially because, you know, as Cinema 4D artists, a lot of them are like, oh, I don't want to have to learn a whole new material system, but it's like, you don't really have to. You could take the knowledge that you already know and bring that over to Unreal so that you could just start getting to work. Like you don't have to learn the systems. And I always feel like, you know, as you get more comfortable and you want to do more advanced stuff, then you're going to start, you know, diving into that, maybe like the blueprints or the nodes and stuff like that. But for just getting started, it brings everything over for you. That's great. And so I'm going to, all my letters here are all spread out. So if I come over to my world outliner, I can actually materialize these all at once. So if I come right here and just select all my letters here, and I'm just going to make these maybe like green, you can see that it's actually putting all the materials on them at once, which is really cool in itself as well. So you can see everything is kind of really spread out here in my scene. And you know, we had some animation inside of Cinema 4D and that stuff did come over as well. So if I click on my folder here, come over to animations, double click on my sequencer here. We have the sequencer in here and it's at 60, um, 60 FPS is which we had in Cinema. So it brings over that information, which is really cool. That's awesome. So if I come over here to perspective, I'm down to cinematic viewport, and then I'm going to click on my camera. Now, if I click play in my viewport, Bam. we have the camera move right there, and everything's brought over. And so it's not that difficult to set your scene up and bring it into Unreal at all. And so that's what I like to show everybody. And down here inside of your sequencer, if I drag this up a little bit, you can see it brings in all the keyframes for everything that we have there. So all the different letters and the camera information, we have all those keyframes and you can actually go through and you can manipulate these in the sequencer as well if you really wanted to. So I love that flexibility about it and it brings over in your raw outliner. This is pretty much the hierarchy that we had inside of Cinema 4D. So all this stuff should look really familiar to you. You shouldn't have any trouble at all jumping in. So from here, let me... I'm going to delete the floor plane because I know we wanted to get into some 426 um, features, right? Like crypto mats and mm -hmm. the different codecs and things of that nature. So let's say that we're happy with this scene. You Can know, you we have a real basic scene here. Uh, yeah. Before yeah. we get into that, there was a the, maybe one or two questions. One about, um, do yeah. you need to save the separate Cinema 4D Cineware file or can you overwrite and still go back to Cineware file and tweak things. So if you need to go back to your DCC tool, uh, is there a workflow right. for going back? So there is no live link as of now, but mm -hmm. I always tell people with the discrepancy, like this still is beta. Like this is pretty much the first iteration of it. And I know that Maxon did receive a, um, a mega grant so that they could work tightly with you guys on better integration. And so as of right now, the workflow is like, if you did need to change something inside of cinema, you would have to re-import that into your scene. 
but um, it depends on what you want to re-import too. Like you don't have to bring in everything. Like say that we weren't happy with this camera move and we wanted to bring in a different camera move and we did that camera move in cinema, we could bring in only that camera. Like I've done that before too. So it's like, I keep everything in Unreal, but only bring over the camera and you know, you could just link that back up and it works perfectly fine. Great. And there was a question also about um, how about if you apply deformers to your meshes, will that stuff come over? So with that stuff, it's kind of hit and miss. Like that's where the R&D comes in. So if you go to my channel, I do cover some of that stuff in my um, on my YouTube channel. Like I know if you use deformers with splines, that stuff tends not to come over. And so there is a workaround for it. Like if you export out as an Alembic file, you can bring that Alembic mm -hmm. file into Unreal and then it will work from there. So I usually, if I bring something over with the, um, the Data Smith importer and it doesn't work, I usually like I'll turn to FBX or Alembic and usually one of those two will work once I bring it into Unreal. Great, great. There are also, uh, you know, when you started getting into the master material and the abilities of the master material, some questions popped in about if you were to apply emissive in Cinema 4D, will that carry you over into the master material or do you need to really implement yes. emissive uh, inside of Unreal Engine? No, 100%. I should have made an emissive material because that's one of my favorite things to show. So I'm back in the Cinema 4D. I'm going to turn these off and go to Luminance. And then let's say you can always change the color once we bring it into Unreal, but let's say I want to do like red for right now. And so I can actually export this scene only with this material in here. I don't believe I have to put it on anything. So I'm going to save this project for Cineware. I'm going to name this one glow underscore UE. I'm just going to actually let me make sure my settings are right first. But yeah, I want to come over to my project setting, hit control D come over and just make sure all these are checked on. And then I'm going to save it out for Cineware. Name it glow underscore UE, click save. Now, if I go back into Unreal Engine, I'm going to go back to the data Smith button here, and I'm just going to import just that material. So if I click on that, click open, and I'm just going to save it to my content folder, click OK. And I'm just going to leave these all turned on, but I mean, really, the only one I need checkmarked is material and textures. I'm just going to click import. And now if I come to the top level in my hierarchy window here, you can see that we have another folder here called glow underscore UE. So if I double click on this, you have a materials folder, which I double click there. You see we have our material there. So if I double click on that, you can see that we have a material mm. With is. the emission here. And so if I wanted to just like really get crazy, I could just turn this way up. That's great. Something like that. And then just click save. And then, yeah, I don't even know why I didn't show this because I love showing people this part here. Let me click on a U. I'm just going to bring that glow material in there. And you can see that the glow, it doesn't give us the effect that we thought we would need. And that's because usually we have to come over and add a post process volume to really highlight that. So I come over to visual effects, come over to post process volume, bring this into my scene. And I won't get too deep into this, but I just like showing this part because I think it's really cool. If I come over to the details panel, if I type in UNB, it comes up with infinite extent unbound. And basically this means Whatever I do inside of this post process volume, it's going to illuminate the entire scene. Like it's not going to be just bound to a certain box. It's going to, whatever I do here, it's going to affect the entire viewport. So I'll make sure to turn that on there. Then if I exit this out and come down to Bloom, if I click on method, I'm just going to leave it standard for now. If I turn on intensity, now you can see we're starting to really get that glow in there, which looks really cool. Let me turn off. They like the yeah something like that. So now you can see we have the glow from that material that we brought in from Unreal Engine in our scene now, which is amazing, right? Because if you do that stuff in two D, it feels like a very much of a two D effect. Where here you're actually getting a very three D glow. Yeah, like if I actually let me go back to my camera, see what it looks like when we're up close. Because it yeah, see it actually works in three D depth and it's illuminating the stuff under it. So 
Yeah, everything, that glow is actually illuminating the things that are around it too. Yeah, awesome. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to change that material back real quick just to red, like so. Oh, and then, um, yeah, did you guys want me to move on to the... Yes, I think so. Like the codex? Yeah, there, there the are going to be more questions stuff. coming in, but please, uh, yeah. Watch okay, forward. so let's say I'm happy with this scene here. I just want to do like a logo animation as we do as motion graphics artists. We do this type of stuff a lot. And say that we wanted to bring this logo into like After Effects for whatever reason. We wanted to composite this over live footage or... You know, there's a whole plethora of different reasons why we want to do it. And so now with the recent version of 4.26, we can render out crypto mats, which I know was a big feature. A lot of people asked me about, I don't work for Epic. So <laughs> it's like, I'm out there with you guys. You just have to go on the forums and just ask for the different stuff that you think that um, would benefit the art or the benefit the engine here. But this is one of the things I know a lot of people asked about and actually put it in, in this release, which is really great. So uh, let me go through those steps again, since I was talking through it. But if I come up here to window and then come over here to cinematics, we have this button here called the movie render queue, which is brand new. This is the new way of rendering out of Unreal Engine. They, up, they actually added this in version 4.25, but they elaborated it on this latest version here. So if I click on that, and I'm actually going to delete this just to kind of show you guys the steps. So we have this green button here called render. And what I'm going to do is click on this. And this is our sequence that we brought over from Cinema 4D. So as a motion graphics artist, we usually call it our timeline. This is our timeline. And we just want to select our timeline here. And then we're going to click on this button here. This is unsaved config. And this is where we're going to configure everything. So by default, you will usually see a JPEG here. And then um, over under output, this is where you would save out your different renders. If you wanted to change the resolution for any reason, you could do that here. You could hold back any type of frame count. Like so if you wanted to start on frame 10 for whatever reason, you could do all that custom stuff here. But if I click on this green button, this is where we start adding all the fun stuff in which we have. Now we have access to Apple ProRes, which I know a lot of people ask me about. We also have access to um, Avid Codex, which is DNX HR, which I'll show you how to activate that as well. And then under rendering, we do have access to new stuff like path tracing, reflections, and material or object IDs, which you see is not activated here. And if you don't see the stuff in your panel here, you just have to go to the plugins panel and activate it. And I'll show you how to do that now, just so you have a reference of how to do it. So it's the same way that we did with the Datasmith plugin. If I come over to settings and come here under plugins, if I click on, I always like to click on built in. I think this all thing might have been updated in the recent version, but I know before I think it only had these two. So I'm just accustomed to hitting built in because this will give us all the plugins that are currently built into Unreal Engine. So if I come to my search panel and I just type DNX, now you see we have the implementation for Avid DNX HD, which if I enable this, it's going to say to restart it, but I'm not going to restart it next. One of the things I like to tell people is if you know right off the bat, there's a couple of plugins that you're going to want activated, make sure you activate all those before you restart it. So you're not restarting every time you want to activate a plugin. And so I'm not going to hit restart next. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not going to hit restart now. I'm actually going to scroll down here until I find a rendering panel, which if I click on rendering and then I have to hit X up in the search. But it's going to bring up all the plugins that have to do with rendering. So if I scroll down here to, I think it says additional render passes. Yeah, so you'll see like this blue plug here. It says movie render queue additional passes. This will activate the crypto mats so that we can render out crypto mats in Unreal. So I'm going to enable it. It's going to tell me that this is in beta because this is the first pass of it, but everything is okay. I'm just going to click on yes. And now I'm going to hit restart now. And then I'm just going to hit save selected to make sure it saves out my project and give this a second to reboot there. And why this is reboot and was there any more questions out there or everything's good? Uh, I think we're all right at the moment. We're good. Okay. 
So we have everything rebooted now. So I'm just going to close this out. I'm just going to go through those steps again real quick. So, oh, before I do that, there is one thing that's very important. So I have to come to my timeline here, aka the sequencer. I'm going to double click on this. And this is something that always got me when I was first starting off in Unreal. And so we can't just render out our sequence here. We have to actually add a com our camera cuts track, which is real easy to find. It's right here under track. If you come right here, you'll see that we have a button here called camera cut track. You click on this, and then you'll see that it adds this new layer here. So from here, what you're going to do is select your camera, and that lets Unreal know this is the camera that we want to render with. Otherwise, it's just going to render this viewport with no type of camera movement at all. So I'm going to click on camera, and then I'm going to click on my camera that I brought from Cinema 4D. Then I'm just going to click on this camera, just to lock it in view. And now if I scrub through it, you can see that we have our, um, our sequence here, which is cool in itself. I showed this on my YouTube channel as well. Like you could use this as like a nonlinear editor. So if you have a couple of tracks that you want to cut together, we can actually come in here with the camera cuts track, edit it as if we're on like Final Cut or Premiere and just edit your shots out, which I thought was really cool in itself too. Cause then you're not stuck to, you know, like rendering out a pass rendering out another pass and then doing edits in another software. It's like you can get all your shots done in Unreal. But now that we have our camera cuts track in here, I'm going to come over to Windows, come down to Cinematics, come down to Render Movie Queue. And I'm just going to go through these steps again, just adding it in here, hit Config. If I click on Settings, now you see we have the Avid DNX HD codec in there. And um, if I scroll down here, we also have object IDs, aka crypto mats. And so it's easy to, you know, set up. The one smart thing about Unreal is we don't have to set a material, or I keep saying material, but an object ID per object. Like for whatever reason, Unreal automatically knows like we need a map for this object, we need a map for this object, we need a map for this object. So you don't have to do any type of other setup other than hit object IDs, and now you're good to go in that regard. And then right here where it says deferred rendering, we can also add a depth pass. So if I come right here where it says deferred rendering data, and right here where it says zero, if I click this down, let me move this out a little bit, you can see that it actually has a depth pass too. So we can add this as a part of our, you know, our um our render pass. So all I have to do is enable it. And then you can add some more too. Like if you click the plus button and you know, if there's other type of passes that you want, like AO or anything of that nature, you can manually put it in here. I would say look at the documentation on further how to implement that because I didn't get that deep into it <laughs> yet. So I can't show that here yet. But the one thing that I did um, figure out too was you can't do render passes with JPEGs or PNGs. So I'm going to delete that. And the only one that's going to work right now because it has more than 8 bits um, worth of data is the EXR file. So if you want to do any type of crypto mats or render passing, you're going to want to mm. use the EXR file. And so because this is 16 bit opposed to the others that are 8 bit, I'm going to click on this one here. I'm just going to leave everything else at default. And I think I'm pretty set up here. So I'm going to click on output. Make sure I pick out a folder that I want to save this stuff to. So I'm just going to make a render folder. Did I already have one? Oh, I guess I had one. So I'm going to click select folder. And then just for time's sake, I think I'm going to just render out maybe like 175 frames. Like right now, my timeline is 500 frames. But I think we get through the full animation at about 175. So I could say 0 to 175 here. And I believe that's good. So I'm going to click accept, make sure I save my project. And then I'm just going to hit right here where it says render local. I'm going to hit this. And now we can see that it's just going to play through and render everything in real time here. The one thing that I did notice with uh, crypto mats, like usually this will fly through the render in like a matter of seconds. But since it's thinking about what um, ID materials, uh, what object IDs it needs to add to each object, I noticed that it just added a little bit of time to my render, but it's nothing too dramatic. Like I think the estimated time here is saying a little bit over a few seconds here. So it doesn't, 
really jump up that much, but that is something to take into account that it is going to just raise your render times there a little bit. And this is, you know, this is, you know, we're now moving outside of real time, right? This is no longer, we're not talking real time. You in the viewport, you're, you're real time. But when we, when we go out right. here, we're, we're okay with it not being real time anymore. Um, right. But even then, you know, even if you're spending a couple of seconds of frame, <laughs> even, you know, you were talking yeah. about, you, you were getting your renders down to a minute of frame, which quite honestly, man, that's a heroic effort. <laughs> yeah, it, for doing it that, but, you know, time, but yeah, yeah, you had to because you know you, deadlines are deadlines. You can't you can't bend time, so you gotta you gotta make your stuff render faster. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would definitely take this over what I was doing before because a lot of times I would do overnight renders, and um, even if you get a ten minute of frame, that still adds out in duration in time. And um, you know, I've know a lot of artists that wake up with that nightmare story. They wake up in the morning, check the render, and you have a black frame or a glitch frames or whatever. Oh. So you're panicking, like, how do we band-aid this? So mm-hmm. you know, you're going into <laughs> After Effects or you know, Nuke or something, and you're just trying to band-aid duplicating that situation a frame. so you can. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. exactly. You are. <laughs> I have no idea what you mean, blending between two frames. Losing <laughs> <laughs> a uh, but Say, um, yeah, time and also, right? <laughs> never, <laughs> never. <laughs> um, you know, it really speaks to like you were saying. There's templates when you start a project now, but this is like right. for us to add crypto mat was a, a fairly significant um, effort that impacted the overall rendering process in Unreal. Um, and we really kind of had to figure out some interesting ways of getting a real time engine to render slower than it was used to, to, to right. spend that because a crypto mat is literally like encrypting each object ID into a cryptography thing. So there's like, you know, basically unlimited combinations to our eyes. It looks like a bunch of co- uh, colors, but, um, well, you know, it, it contains like object information all this stuff that's packed in there and to get unreal to slow down <laughs> and spend more than a 30th of a second doing stuff was really an interesting challenge here um, but you know it was really important because this this render queue and these render passes are are key um, you know right. up until this point unreal only rendered what it needed to render Mm -hmm. you know the g buffers that needed to render to present the image and then threw them away and then it was off to the next image so this has been a a very interesting effort to get to get a game engine to produce film assets frames (laughs) i know um just talking to a few nuke artists i know they were excited at the fact because they can really start utilizing this stuff but as like an after effects artist like i started it was interesting because like in motion graphics, a lot of times we do our render passes out of like ridge shift and then we bring it into after effects where we start doing auto polishing and final compositing and everything. But it's just like working on these past few projects with um, Andy and Patrick for the unreal engine logo animation. Like Patrick would ask me, he's like, why are you sending stuff to after effects? And I'm just like, that's what I'm accustomed to. Like my mind is trained to automatically bring renders into After Effects for color correction or depositing or whatever. And he's like, you can do all that stuff in Unreal. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, Unreal could kind of be your end all be all. You don't have to take that, you know, the other steps unless you absolutely need to. So the way that I start conditioning myself is, you know, with the post process volume, I'm doing my color correction in there. I'm adding LUTs in there. You can actually, you know, it has a chroma key in here. So you can actually chroma key people in Unreal and place them actually in the environment. There's like no fake two and a half D stuff. It's like, you're just actually placing your green screen stuff in there. And this is like a totally different way of working, which is really interesting because like, I know a lot of people are comfortable with the render passes and sending them out, but I can see it getting to the point to where you no longer mm-hmm. really need to do that and listen like circum, uh, special circumstances. Makes sense. Isn't that the dream? <laughs> and then on the but, side you can just make Fortnite. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in your but, spare time. Um, <laughs> in your spare if time. If you guys want 
I opened up After Effects. If you want me to show you real right. quick what yes, the please. crypto mats look like in there, this will only take a few seconds, but this is my EXR pass right here. So I'm just going to bring in my EXR sequence. Then I'm just going to make sure that it comes in at 60 frames per second. Okay, cool. So 60. Okay, I'm just going to make a new composition here. You can see that we have our animation in here. Everything looks good, but we don't have any crypto mats here. And this is something I believe they added in the newest version of After Effects 2020. If I come over to my effects and presets, if I type in crypto, now we have this under 3D channels, we have this um, plugin for crypto mats, which I can actually bring into my scene. And now we can see the crypto mats inside of Cinema 4D, Dang. or not Cinema 4D, but the other one. In un uh, yeah, After Effects. I'm getting the market fees. <laughs> But the cool thing about the reason I like this one is really cool. Like if I click on layer and then just click OK, I can hold down the shift key and I could just start selecting the mats here in my viewport. So select that. Now I can see the crypto map for the U. I can see it for the, the map for the R. Wow. And then if I come over here under output and just do, I think it's matted colors. No, matter RGB. So there we go. Now we have it cut out in our scene and if you wanted to go and like say okay maybe i wanted to add a couple of more of these in here because i want to just add levels to like the u and the unreal now i could come here and now i could just start adding like levels or curves or whatever to it and so i thought that was pretty intuitive Dang. too and then we also remember we had a depth pass in here as well which um i think it's under 3d channel depth is it extractor i think because you have to extract the data from the exr so i believe it was extractor or come under i believe it's this one uh it's not coming in a hundred percent i had figured it out earlier this is something that i'm still trying to understand because talking to nuke artists it seemed like this is the color code that they were used to bringing in depth passes but not in after effects but i know if you use this extractor here you can actually extract or extract the depth pass, which you can see a little bit here, but I have to learn more about how to actually implement that. But yeah, that was just a quick rundown on some of the new render tools that I know a lot of people have been asking me about, which is phenomenal that they're actually there now. That's pretty cool. That is amazing. So is there anything else that you guys wanted to go through or that was kind of the elevator pitch well i guess that's longer than the elevator but <laughs> the, how you bring what is stuff this, from a mass effect internal. elevator exactly <laughs> this was the load screen <laughs> elevator <laughs> yeah so we're just actually waiting for the next scene to load up the whole time <laughs> that's uh it, it's so cool to see how how this stuff works together and and, and, and some insight into your workflow too. Like, you know, uh, it's kind of common to, to workflows moving to Unreal. You know, you probably spent a whole lot of time in your material editor in your previous application. And now it's more like, let's just make sure we throw some colors on stuff and name a couple of these so that when it comes in, we, we we're organized. Uh, what, what? And uh, that's that's all. That's you know that's honestly a bitter pill for a lot to swallow. So it's really cool to see that you know that that Cinema Forty and and that material comes in like that because uh, that's yeah. such a a pain point, such like a high anxiety thing for people moving from application to application. Um, and it's right. something that you know for our games folk, I think we're kind of like. You're going to need to build a, a material yourself and get it super optimal and get it to fit exactly with your game. Um, but right. for folks coming from other places, they're not, they're kind of handed yeah, a shader with, yeah. yeah. Tell us what color it is and how metallic it is. And, <laughs> and so and we're, we're like, no, no, show us nodes in math. And they're, it, it's rightfully intimidating. So it's really right. cool to see how. And how robust that material is and comfortable it is for for someone coming from cinema 4d that they don't have to like reinvent the wheel yeah and i know a major point too is like a lot of artists like they build the arsenal of materials and whatever render engine they're using so whether it's v-ray or redshift 
it's like they spent years buying material packs. And so it's kind of like they're in that walled garden and they don't want to, you know, it's like, oh, I made this investment in all these materials. I don't want to have to do that again. And which I always points people to the mega skins library because mm. a lot of those materials are in there and they come with like your epic account. And so I don't think it's updated yet for 4.26 with the, um, the Quixel bridge, but like what I like to do is I go to bridge and then I just find the materials that I want. Mm -hmm. It's like export the unreal land. Boom. You have your material. You don't have to worry about the nodes or anything. It's kind of just like playing with Legos at that point. It's just drag and drop and make everything look real nice and pretty. So let me ask you a, a question. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mark. Sorry. There, there was a general question here that um, a lot of the work that you, you still do is done within um, Cinema 4D, but a lot of it could be done actually in Unreal. Do you see yourself doing more in Unreal and less in Cinema as time goes by? It just, um, <clears throat> like every project has a different situation to tackle. So I've been just using you know, for whatever project it is, just using the right tools for that situation. So like the one thing I do like about Cinema 4D is the MoGraph tools, which, you know, you get instance like an infinity of a certain object and you could do like all these weird and crazy things with the different effectors and stuff, which is like really cool. So I still love doing that type of stuff and particle effects and stuff in Cinema 4D, but I think they merge, you know, together quite nicely and I can only see them merging together even better here in the future and so I would say I went and picked one or the over the other I would just like to keep using both yeah so you um enjoy the tech uh there are plenty of people that work in probably motion graphics that like their workflows maybe they spend the majority of their time in after effects um maybe they offload some stuff to cinema 4d uh, maybe their their workflow is Photoshop to After Effects, and, yeah. and they do um, most of their stuff in 2D or whatever the case is. Unreal is a massive tool. It, I think, sometimes intimidates people. Um, and would you say, how much of Unreal would you say that you've had to learn in order to adopt your workflow? And I know that that's a hard question to ask because Unreal, who knows how much Unreal you have, you know, some people know. Uh, how much Tom knows, how much I know, how much Mark knows. Uh, did you say you had right. to learn a lot of Unreal in order to do this work? Uh, you know, you've been at it since SIGGRAPH of 2019. That's how many months would you say? Yeah. that? Uh, that's, I guess just a little bit over a year now, yeah. A little over a year, and you've already become proficient yeah. enough to work and, and do client work in Unreal. So that is not a lot of time to, and you've already been doing this for, well, let's say after you, dove in how long did it take for you to start doing client work in unreal um i would say probably after six months i just like to make sure that i'm really comfortable with it but that mm -hmm. was um like my very first client project was actually for maxon and that was for nab so the actual the thumbnail that we're using for this showcase that was actually built that was like my very first client project like i built the bumper animations for Cinema 4D Live. And at that point, I was like, I really wanted to use Unreal because I've been dabbling in it. I've been doing tutorials in it. And it's kind of like, you got to put your money where your mouth is. And so right. I just went full in. And that's the way that I learned any type of application, honestly. Like, I don't know. My wife says I like to torture myself. But <laughs> it's like, when I wanted to learn Redshift, I took a client project and i was like okay i'm going to learn redshift and i've made myself only use that just so i become proficient with it mm -hmm. and the same thing happened with cinema 4d too like i had an opportunity to work on fantastic four rise of the silver surfer they were using cinema 4d for that movie and they asked me if i knew it which i didn't know cinema back then i knew 3d max that's what they taught us in school but i was like of course i know cinema because i really wanted to work on a marvel movie mm -hmm. And so I kind of like I just stayed at the studio every night till like 3 a.m. This is pre YouTube. So we just had the thick manual. I'm just <laughs> reading through the manual, trying to make it, you know, so that it sounds like I know what I'm talking about when all the other artists came in. So I'm just learning everything on the fly. So I kind of just <laughs> that's just kind of how I, um, you know, you throw both feet into the fire and you just roll with the punches. But I always say I know everybody's not built like that, but you still have the basics of, you know, 3D, like, you know, essentially 
everything in Unreal is still everything that, like, if you're proficient in Maya, Cinema, Blender, you should have no problem moving over to Unreal. It's just a different train of thought. Like, the hotkeys might be different, or the way your viewport navigates yeah. must be different. But, I mean, it's just muscle memory at that point. Like, I know when I came from Cinema to Unreal, I hated the way the viewport worked in Unreal. I'm like, why is everything inverted, and why can't I do <laughs> this and that? And I'm going through the preferences, and I'm checkmarking everything I can to make it work the same way it does in cinema. But over a while, I'm just like, I'm flying through Unreal, especially since I work, I learned like the WASD keys. I'm like, yeah. oh, this is like I'm playing Doom or something. So yeah, yeah. now I'm flying through <laughs> Unreal. And when I get into cinema, I'm like, why can't I do it like I'm playing Call of Duty? <laughs> like, yeah. why isn't my camera moving the same? So it's just all muscle memory and become adaptive to it. Well, let me ask you another question. How do you learn Unreal? Do you... Uh, what is your process? Do you go into the documentation? Do you go watch other people's YouTube videos? Do you go to Unreal Online Learning? What is your process for learning Unreal? Yeah, so after I figured out the Datasmith plugin stuff, you know, there was just those things that will always pop up like, oh, I want to learn how to make my own materials or how do I even render out of it? Like, you know, I'm doing screenshots, but I didn't even know how to render out of it. And so I, um, I, I saw that tab up on the Epic Games launcher for the, I think it's called the Unreal Learning Academy. Mm -hmm. And it has all these free resources. And so I went in there and there was actually a video called Your First Hour in Unreal. So I went through that course there and that took me to a different level of understanding of how everything worked. But then I just started to explore those free resources even more. And then I found one like on a sequencer. And so I took the sequencer course, which is free as well. And I learned how the sequencer worked and how to really, you know, navigate the cameras and the viewport. And it kind of just built on top of that. And then I just was, um, I was still stuck in my train of thought as a MoGraph artist. Like everything wasn't working exactly how I thought it should. And so I was like, let me watch some game developers on Twitch and see how they're kind of building their stuff out. Because there's like a lot of indie game devs here on Twitch. Mm. So I would just go in there and... I would just ask questions like, hey, I see you're doing this. I'm trying to learn Unreal. Why are you doing this this way? Like, that's how I learned how to gray box because people are like, yeah, we don't just build the entire level in Maya or Houdini. It's like we kind of gray box it, make sure it feels good. Then we bring it into Unreal. And that's when we start doing the polishing. And it just clicked for me. I'm like, I had my aha moment. And then I just started working with a different frame state of mind. And it just all naturally progressed from there. I was just going to say that there was a question there from some people about um, Pixel for 426. It was actually updated yesterday. I just needed oh, to go. Really? I needed to go and check my oh. sanity because I updated today and I thought, I'm sure I did that. So yeah, it works. And Lewis, for you, they have the little guy back in to give you the um, sense of scale back. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I have to go update because yeah, people hit me up about that too. They're like, why would I update the 26? I can't even use my mega scans. And now, Give it a couple of days. I'm like, relax. Yep. <laughs> it's coming. I mean, that was yeah, awesome. that that uh, hour of that first hour, your first hour in Unreal is an excellent course. And I, I point a lot of people to that because it really does. It's 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 like less than an hour even. <laughs> yeah. So don't even be intimidated by spending an hour. I think it's like 46 minutes long. Uh, and it, <laughs> you know, you, you kind of learn how to move around, drop some stuff in, make a couple of things happen, make a little blueprint happen even. And um, yeah, it's, it's really solid and it really helps kind of someone Joey mentions how intimidating unreal is and it totally is because yeah. it does everything under the sun and you can make a right. Fortnite. um <laughs> so it's right. it's rightfully intimidating and yeah, there's these, I mean, these nice entry modes state. and it has to this weird technology that not everyone looks good with a beard so <laughs> you have to be prepared i would say to um to promote myself too that's exactly why i created my course as well so all the bumps and bruises I took into learning this stuff, I tried to outline my course into if I was still learning Unreal, which, I mean, this worked out perfectly because I was still kind of learning Unreal as well, but it's like coming from motion graphics and I want to learn Unreal, how would I want to get from point A to point B? And so that's when I was doing the outline for my course, I took in a lot of feedback from a lot of artists that were interested and 
We even had beta testers and everything else. And the course, it's been getting like phenomenal feedback, the one on MoGraph.com. So I, I know a lot of motion graphics artists that took the course and then they took their first client project. Like I, I posted stuff up on my Instagram as well a lot, but I had someone reach out to me. Like I had this tight deadline for this commercial for a board game I had to make. We only had a week and I wasn't sure how we were going to do it. People pointed me to your course. I took it. I took all my stuff from cinema into Unreal, produced a commercial spot in a few days and the client loved it. And it turned out great. So I'm just like, I guess the course is working the way that I intended it to, but it's given that step-by-step -step one. If you're a motion graphics artist, what the steps you should take to get yourself familiar with Unreal. One of the things which I think we probably all know here is one of the best ways to learn software is to actually teach it. Um, yeah. It really does help. Mm -hmm. If you explain it to somebody else, then you'll actually understand it better yourself. Yeah, 100%. And also, um, you know, it can be intimidating, <clears throat> but Go gentle on yourself. You don't have to learn it all in a day. Um, it will take time. Just do a little bit at a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think personal projects is huge. Like if you see something on, online that inspires you and you're like, I wonder how they created that. Like go to ArtStation or Behance or something and say like, oh, that environment looks cool. I want to recreate that. And that kind of gives you some type of goal to lean towards. And as you're trying to recreate that yourself, you're learning along the way. So I would say, you know, personal projects are key. Like definitely just take on some personal projects and you'll learn that way as well. Enjoy yourself. It should be fun. Yeah, yeah. I know I have a blast working in Unreal. Like I've been throwing in the car templates and the third person templates in my environments and just going crazy. So yeah, it's once you learn it, it gets really fun. Like all the different stuff you could do in there. Well, we want to really thank you for uh, sharing all that information and coming on the stream and uh, um, you know, and, and really all the work that you've been doing uh, to help uh, the motion graphics community um, understand the power of unreal i think that moving into the next versions of unreal there's going to be even more focus on motion graphics and in general um what it can do on that side and and i think that it, it could even evolve how uh, people that focus in this type of work might even be able to utilize real time as a as a whole um because i think it's been right. done you know the same way or a similar way for a very long time, but this could be a an interesting game changer when you know the rules change a little bit because I think this is a bit of a rules change too. Yeah, one hundred percent.